Okay, pre-cal 12, let's get after it. Here we go, we got a video on function review. So this is just gonna be a uh, small little reminder, review of what functions are, how function notation works, because we're gonna have to really jump both feet into that for section 2.2. So here we go. First off, what is a relation versus a function? So anything you can graph on your grid is what we call a relation. So you can see you got two images down below, they're both graphs, they're both relations. Now, before I get into qualifications, even if you just had, I'll do them in red. Now imagine that graph wasn't there. Even if you just had a collection of points on a grid, that's also a relation because what it is, is it is a relationship between an X and a Y value that allows you to exist on your grid. So anything you plot on a two dimensional grid is a relation. So both of these are relations. They just happen to be in this case, a sideways parabola. If you don't know what a parabola is, it's a U-shaped graph. And then this one is just your basic parabola. So yeah, they're both graphs plotted on a grid. They can be made up of points or not. They are both relations. So how do we determine if a relation becomes a function? Well, in order to become a function, well, actually, let's look at it back here. In order to become a function, you have to pass a very, very important test. And it is called the vertical line test. And as I like to refer to it for simplicity, the VLT. So if you pass what's called the vertical line test, you graduate from a relation to a function. And it's really, really simple. Draw a vertical line anywhere through your graph. And you can see here, no matter where I draw this vertical line, obviously, if I don't draw it on the graph, it doesn't count but does it intersect my graph at more than one location? And here, intersection, 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 right? So I'm not looking at all the lines, I'm really only just looking at one of them, and if that ever were to occur, I have two intersection points, it does not pass. So if it doesn't pass the vertical line test, it stays simply a relation. Now, that's the same, I'm gonna use that grid just off to the left here for a little caveat here. Even if you just had a bunch of points, so if I had a point here and a point here, and a point here, and a point here, that's still a function because it passes the vertical line test. But if you had two points that existed at the same X value, then you can see if I drew a line through, I wouldn't pass the vertical line test anymore. So then you would not be a function with respect to a set of points. Now, generally, um, when we get into what a polynomial is, which we'll look at in section three, polynomials have to be continuous graphs. So there's a difference between a function and a polynomial. But the big one for a function is it has to pass the vertical line test. And the one on the left does not, but you can see the graph on the right here, no matter where I draw a vertical line, I will only cross that graph one time. So the upwards U, or the traditional parabola, passes. This one passes the vertical line test, which makes it a function. So if you pass the vertical line test, you graduate from a relation to a function. So what about then from what's called a function to a one-to-one -one function? Well, in order to be a function, you've already passed the vertical line test. So you can see this graph, it passes the vertical line test, right? So we already know that it's a function. And you can't be a one-to-one -one function if you're not already a function. So your first sort of criteria is you graduate, you pass the vertical line test. Once you've passed the vertical line test, you then check the next test, which is the horizontal line test. So you draw a horizontal line. And here you can see, nope, it crosses twice. It doesn't matter where you cross this graph, you're gonna cross it twice. Does not pass, right? Gentleman or Gandalf, it does not pass. So this is still just a function. But the graph on the right, the diagonal line, well, of course it passes my vertical line test. Of course it passes my vertical line test. So once it passes the vertical line test, you need to ask, does it also then pass the horizontal line test? It needs to pass both tests. And if you draw a horizontal line, you will also only ever cross it once. So that is an example of a one-to-one -one function. If you look and you consider it, it's that every independent X value tracks to an independent Y value, but it needs more than that in the definition. Because if you look at the 
uh, the graph on the left, every X value does in fact track to a different Y value, but the problem is the Y values also need to independently track to a given X value. And here, these two Y values track to different X values, which is why you can cross it with a horizontal line. Whereas no matter where you are on this graph, each X and Y combination is unique. And that is what gives us a one-to-one -one function. So that's relation, function, one-to-one -one function. Do you pass the vertical line test? Do you pass the horizontal line test? So now the next thing we're gonna look at was function notation. So this is an example here of function notation. Now, if you haven't seen this yet, don't freak out because really it's just y equals x plus five. What we do is we replace the value y with the value what we call f of x. Okay, it's pronounced f of x. It's the equation of my function with respect to x. So the f of x is your output. The f of x is your y value. So as you put in an x value, you solve for a y value. Think about what that means on a grid. If I wanted to exist there, I go, okay, what's my x value? And it spits out my y value. That is what function notation means. So if you look at this first example, given f of x equals 3x plus 5, determine where it exists or determine the coordinates of the point at f of 2. So we're just substituting. We substitute in a 2 into our function. So anywhere you see an x in your function, you substitute in a 2. And where you go from there is you solve it out. So 3 times 2 is 6. 6 plus 5, you get 11. So what that means is f of 2 is equal to 11, but that means you exist at the point 2, comma, 11. When 2 is your input, 11 is your output. And that's what this function machine does. That's what the f of x means. So let's look at another one, except in this case now you'll see it's slightly different. I have nothing in with the x. It means what is the coordinate to the point when f of x equals negative 7? Well, that's the same as saying when y equals negative 7. So if you consider the equation f of x equals 3x plus 5, well, we are substituting f of x for its value, which is negative 7. Right? We're not substituting a value in for x. We're actually substituting the entire f of x value for a given amount. And then what we're doing is we're solving now for the x value using just a little bit of good old-fashioned algebra. Minus 5 from both sides. Negative 12 equals 3x. Divide both sides by 3 x equals negative 4. So we get the point negative 4 and y is negative 7. So you've worked backwards. You've kind of worked uh, outside in in that case. So what about domain and range? So just remember that domain and range represent um, how you consider all the potential x values and y values. Domain is all of the x values that exist on your graph. So what that means is if you have a graph and I'm going to restrict it. So I'm going to, it stops there. So here's a graph. The only X values that will produce a Y value are the X values that exist between those two points. So how you would write that, I'm going to give this some value here. Let's say that's negative five on my X axis and this is six on my X axis. Anything in between those two and including those points is in my domain. So I would say my domain is negative five less than or equal to x less than or equal to six because that means x can be negative five on the negative end x can be six on the positive end but x can also be anything in between similarly for your uh we'll, we'll do range in a minute now remember that you can have a graph that isn't a graph it's just a collection of points so what does that do to your domain the other thing you can have is you can have a graph that extends forever. So what does that do for your domain? So first, if you have a graph that looks like this, extends forever in either direction along the x-axis, the domain is everything. There are no x values that won't produce a y value because that graph extends infinitely in either direction. So in this case, your domain would be what we call all real numbers. All numbers are allowed. And there's a funky symbol, kind of looks like a one with an R. That means all real numbers. So that's special situation, well, not special, pretty regular situation, number one. And then the other one is if you just have a collection of points. So let's just say we have a point here, a point here, and a 
point here. And for the sake of it, that's negative four, that's one, and that's four. In this case, you do your domain in a curly set of brackets, and only the x values of those exact points are in the domain. So negative four is in my domain, one is in my domain, and four is in my domain, and only those values. So if you have points, it can only exist at those points. You do not have continuous connection. The curves do not attach. So then what about range? Well, range is very similar. We'll look at the three different scenarios. We'll start with the points again. So we'll try to replicate similar locations here, but it doesn't really make a difference. So let's say that was at negative four, that was at one, and that was at five. But the important one in this case is that's one, that's two, and that's seven. Because in the range, we're interested in the y values. So in this case, our range would be in curly brackets, one, two, and seven only the values of the y values of my three points because that's all that is covered by my graph those lines are not connected so i can't include everything in between the next example uh, was if we had a continuous line in either direction so let's just say we had our graph and again we had something that looks like that well again this line is extending up and down infinitely in either direction so this will be another example of all real numbers. So, so far we haven't had to worry too much about anything. But what about, what if we have a restricted domain or a restricted range like we saw in that first example for domain. So say I have a point, caps an endpoint there, and I have a graph that looks like that. Well, the uppermost point is 8 and the lowest most point, let's say those are at the same spot, let's say negative 4. So the lowest your graph goes is negative 4. The highest your graph goes is 8. So in this case you have negative 4 is less than or equal to y, which is less than or equal to 8, because now we're talking our y values. So it's everything that exists in between the lowest most point, negative 4, and the highest most point, 8. Domain and range get a bad rap and they get overly complicated, but we're going to look at them a lot. So if you're confused after the video, after the workbook, after the lesson, please come talk to me, get some clarification on domain and range. Domain is x. Range is why. So that's our first video, section 2.1. That was really a quick supplemental review. Uh, and we're going to jump right into uh, arithmetic combinations of functions, which sounds as lovely as it is. So I'll see you next video. And good luck. Keep it up.